civil courts. But one of the best things you can do is being vocal. I know it's hard to tell your stories. I know if a, as a journalist, sometimes you feel like nobody's listening. But one of the most powerful um, tools against the judiciary, even in some, and I'm sure these ladies are wonderful deputy district attorneys, but even against some of the district attorneys uh, that I've known in California, is the use of the media. Uh, it, it is a very, very powerful tool. It takes demonstrating, it takes courage to get up there. However, it is how you get things changed. Um, and the one example I can give you is the passage of this law of 2008. We were up against huge money. Obviously, the defense bar, but nobody wanted victims to have a constitutional right. Because even um, the, some prosecutors, because it actually made them be accountable. Like now they can't dismiss a case without discussing it with the victims, things like that. Um, so, but by taking it just to people out there, general people like you who have been have experienced things, we were able to pass it with 6.2 million votes in the state of California. Um, so I think that is one place to start. It's hard, and I understand that, it's hard not to back down, but there are, believe it or not, some of the attorneys out there that actually do really care um, and will go and help. I recently was just brought into a case, I'm beginning in San Mateo County, a woman that's experiencing much the same that all of you have experienced with her three children. Um, he was charged with six counts of sexual assault on three minor children, and it got dismissed, which is something that we're reviewing right now and taking to the Attorney General's office to have them review, but now she's getting tossed into family law court. So one of the things I would seriously is look at that. One of the things we're starting in this case is basically a media campaign to highlight what happened, that it got swept under the rug by the DA, that it's getting swept under. One of the other things, and I just talked with her, that we're looking at is writing a law and mandating that in family law court, judges be trained on the issues of sexual assault. A lot of problem um, with the bench anywhere in any state is that they are political appointments, they come from all walks of life. So typically what happens to avoid conflict, if you were a former prosecutor and you're appointed to the bench, you're not put into criminal courts, they throw you into civil courts, and vice versa. So you get attorneys, judges now, that don't um, have any background and sexual assault, don't understand the signs of sexual assault, don't understand that children don't normally disclose and that sometimes they do recant, there's the whole thing. So that is a piece of legislation, and I would encourage any of you, you're welcome to call me, it's a piece of legislation that we are actually trying to write for this next cycle that it be mandated. Um, one of the other things is not be afraid to take on a judge. Um, I know that sounds odd, uh, at least in California, we do have the Judicial Performance Review Committee. My mom actually was a member of it for years. Um, it is an avenue to take on. I do believe the judges need to be held accountable. I think they have too great of an immunity. I'm not quite sure what can be done, but I'm not a huge fan of judges, if you can tell. Um, so, um, I, but I think, think tanks like this become important. I think getting your story out there, um, certainly if you're in a criminal arena, it's maybe some prosecutors have prosecutors don't like it, but being the squeaky wheel, making sure that your rights here in California were unique now because of the passage of this legislation where you do have rights, that you do have the right to be involved in your criminal case, that you have the right to be consulted. That means you don't have the ultimate say. Obviously, some of the prosecutors have the ultimate say, but you at least get to be part of the process, and I think that's very, very important as well. And perhaps that's something that can dovetail into family law. One of the things I did when I ran the units, both for Placer and Sacramento, I then did it in my deputy days, and this is something you can take back to your counties, would go every morning, we'd send somebody over to the family law courts to comb the files for the restraining orders in our domestic violence cases and in our sexual assault cases, so that we were actually able to combine them. Um, and we'd bring those restraining orders into criminal, which was very powerful, um, and it, boosted our criminal case, because obviously if you can get a criminal conviction, it does help you in family law. Um, I know that's not always the case, but again, also searching out, there's a lot of um, people out there that are wonderful experts. I know sometimes it's costly, but there are people that will come and assist. Uh, so really, it's unfortunately, because of the system, because you don't get an attorney in family law, uh, will point it to you, and I realize that's hard, but perhaps that's something that can also be looked at. Um, I believe the psychologist yeah. suggested that. 
Uh, the other thing I would also look at doing is advocating for change in Miners Council. I serve as Miners Council for three counties here. Uh, but I'm picked by the bench in those counties because of my background, I'm put into the sexual assault cases. So again, mandating training is huge. Um, they really should have to go through comprehensive training on sexual assault, on the signs, on the signs of, um, you know, how men and women respond. And parental alienation has become a term that nobody really understands that it's pretty clear to tell parental alienation. I mean, I do, I argue them all the time, against it all the time, and I have, unfortunately, a very good psychologist that helps me in Foster County, um, that, you know, you can tell parental alienation. There's a difference between parental alienation and protecting the child. And I think that's something that is not flushed out at all in the bench or above minors' councils or things like that. So I really think mandating some legislation for training would be huge in some ways. The other thing you can do, believe it or not, our judges come up for election. Um, and I have been instrumental in several counties in getting judges kicked off the bench. And again, it's using, and I hate to use that term, but finding people with stories such as yours. Because people actually care. They don't want to be in that. And that's yeah, a powerful thing to get an incumbent judge removed. But when you've got somebody running that's a good person, um, it's well worth it. It's a lot of work, but it means getting out there. It means telling your story. And I know that can be very difficult. I've been in a position where I've had to tell my story numerous times. Um, but when you see it start to make a difference, it really can. You had a question? Yes, um, you're from Foster County. Yeah. Are you familiar with the Connie Bedwell case, and have you done anything to help her? I just received a call the other day, and I told her that I would be happy to meet with her. It wasn't directly from her, it was from somebody that knew her. Um, and then, like I said, I just helped, uh, got a call from this lady in San Mateo County. Um, so there are things that can be done, and one of the things, you know, our group does, and on the political side is we really do go in and go after judges. I mean, I tell that, and we've been known to go after a few head DAs on occasion too. Um, but those are things that need to be done. And um, it just takes, you know, the strength that you have from your experiences to really do that. But I would encourage that in your home counties, um, especially the judges that have, for lack of a better word, that have screwed you, they still have to come up for election. Sure. How do we do that? The office number is 530-885-9544. You're certainly welcome. Um, you know, and if you would like to join in, and was, the whole legislation thing just came up the other day. If you have ideas, um, you know, we'd love to help write a piece of legislation to get it through. Thank you very much. If a court through an evaluation, like a evaluation, if the psychologist recommend an attorney for the children. Is that considered a court appointed attorney at that point? It can be done two ways. Um, I was actually privately hired in a case in Nevada County and they allowed it up there. I, that's the only county I've ever seen that's allowed it. I have a gut feeling though with the financial crisis, if a family can afford it, I think more and more judicial judges may allow it. But um, when the court appoints, yes, you're court appointed. We're supposed to go through specialized training in order to be minors counsel. Um, yeah, however, I've been through the training and it's interesting, I brought that up at the last training, that there was a very little section on the size of sexual assault. And I'm actually, it's the judicial counsel group, you're probably know better than I do, that oversees that training. And that's something that again too, you know, should be brought to their attention. There should, it's a three day training and I think an hour of it was on sexual assault. Um, and these are the people that are representing the kids in the civil cases. So again, that's an avenue to look at. I do think a lot goes back to training. So my second part of that is, can you get rid of the county the I mean, by the court in any way, is there an avenue to do that? There can be a motion made. It's very difficult to do, I'll be honest with you, but there can be a motion made if there's obvious bias. Either side can bring it up. Um, they do an in-camera hearing and then it basically a decision of the judge. Unfortunately, good or bad, judges have quite a bit of power as you probably have come up against. Um, and that can be good in some cases and bad in some cases. Can we pull the questions until after each of the panel members? Oh, sure. What's your name? My name's Nina. 530-885-9544. Um, and that goes to the Crime Victims United office. And again, I, you know, if we want to put together a think tank for some legislation, we'd be more than happy to do that. So. Well, I'll, I'll go then. Nobody's chomping at the bit over there. Um, 
I know a number of you who presented, and I obviously have been working on this issue on a policy level for a few years. And what really strikes me is that every single person who spoke about a case had parental alienation used against you as the rationale for taking your children away. And as many of you know, we introduced a bill last year in the legislature, AB 612, to try to eliminate or outlaw the use of PAS and family court. Um, we got a lot of pushback from the Assembly Judiciary Committee saying it wasn't the legislature's job to um, advise judges on what sorts of evidence they should and should not hear. But I think all of you who lived through this nightmare know that parental alienation appears to be the number one tool that is used by perpetrators, attorneys, to switch the tables, to shift everything in your case and take your child away from you. So um, I would love for the other panelists who are members of law enforcement and have more um, backing in the official system, I'm more of an outsider to the system, but I'd love to know what you all think, what would be a practical way to get rid of parental alienation syndrome um, and or enforce <laughs> that um, it cannot be used. We had judges at that hearing saying, we don't teach parental alienation syndrome in California. That's not allowed in California. And we all know, as 35 of you stood up at the microphone at that hearing and said, PAS has destroyed my family. So um, I see that as just a critical, critical piece of stopping the, the carnage in family court. The other issue, um, immunity, and I know our keynote speaker talked about that this morning. We have a new bill, AB 2475, that will limit judicial immunity for court appointees in family court. So um, that is going to be a huge battle. The industry of people making hundreds of thousands of dollars off of your families who are suffering horrific violence are going to fight very hard to keep that from happening. Um, and so I think other creative ways that those here on the panel who work more closely in the system help us strategize. I love that Nina offered to do a think tank with us about legislation. Crime Victims United has been very successful in their legislative advocacy. Um, the fact that they had a ballot measure they were able to fund is something I know a number of us have talked about. Why don't we take this to the people. Let's get a ballot measure. Well, that costs a couple million dollars, which those of you who've been through the system, you're a couple million in the hole by the time you're um, five or ten years into the system, or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars in the hole. We don't have a lot of deep pockets in this movement. Um, so while I agree with Nina, it'd be nice to also get some judges unseated. That takes money as well. And in some of the smaller counties, like our county in Marin, the entire legal establishment will stand up behind the incumbents and everybody will give money to the incumbents. And it's you know extremely rare that there's a challenger who has a chance in hell of unseating an incumbent uh, because people just won't get involved in these judges' races. So. Um, I think, you know, figuring out where can we tap some resources to support a ballot measure, um, to work with people in the system who are sympathetic, like DAs and county supervisors, others who are here. What can be done on an administrative level to ensure that the laws in California are being followed? We have some of the best laws in the country. It means nothing to any of you on the ground, though, because those laws are routinely being ignored in family court. Um, the other theme that I hear is a lack of accountability in the system. That's something the Center for Judicial Excellence is very much founded on, is demanding accountability. Our very first move before we even knew about the problems in family law was to run around the legislature and say, we need judicial performance evaluations. 20 other states in the country have these, which allows litigants and lawyers and court employees and jurors and others to evaluate judges on the canon of judicial ethics. Are they doing their jobs? Are they treating litigants and everyone they interact with with respect? Are they following state laws and procedures? Are their written opinions clear and understandable? 
these are not, um, they're not being evaluated on the politics of what their decisions are. It's strictly based on are they acting in a judicious manner and you know, essentially abiding by their sworn oath of office. The California Judges Association came down hard saying, we don't need to be evaluated. Um, you know, they fought us tooth and nail. The, the state is in a budget crisis, and so we've been told that's a nice idea when the state gets some money back because it's going to cost money to have these JPEs. Even though the American Bar Association supports it, all these other states where it's happening, the judges actually like it because they get positive press when they are shown that they're doing a good job. These evaluations would be part of a voter guide so that voters would be told that judges are abiding by the law, doing well by their constituents. So it creates an incentive for good behavior. Right now, there's no incentive in the family law system for anyone to do right. It's just sort of a crapshoot if you find someone who has an ethical conscience, who isn't a part of this PAS mill that seems to be the reigning paradigm in family law. Um, the, my, I guess my final thought, you all know my positions because we've worked on this, but I love, I'm saying a lot of this so the panel might be able to respond as well, is um, if there were a way to remove profit out of the family law system with all of these court appointees, I mean, we're talking about the American justice system. It should be based on truth and facts and the law, and it has become a mill of fee mongering and people that are making profit out of placing children with a parent that is not taking care of that child adequately and is putting the child in harm's way. And these sound like very difficult things. I mean, we're essentially talking about completely changing the face of family law, but um, part of being on this pa panel is Connie asked us to think outside the box and to think creatively about how we can stop the carnage that's happening in family law for all these children. And I guess I'd love to know if anyone on the panel has thoughts about that, is whether it's been a similar battle in the criminal courts or is there some sort of major change that could be made to take away the influence of this cottage industry of folks who really are accountable to no one. And I think some of these bills around PAS and limiting immunity for these court appointees, and, and I'm not so sure about jury trials. I do think it's helpful to have more people involved in these important decisions. I think the NDIC that we heard from this morning was a very hopeful model for um, certainly investigating these cases in a more um, forensic, invest investigatory manner than um, the lack of investigation that's going on so much with family law. But I know in Texas, the family law system does have jury trials, and a lot of the same shenanigans go on, and the juries are often misled by the shenanigans in the, in the system. So I don't believe that jury trials is necessarily um, a solution in its own right, but it's a step in the right direction. So we certainly have our work cut out for us, and um, I'll turn it Any kind of, it was a, if it was a domestic violence case, or it was a divorce, any kind of uh, family law context, the assumption uh, uh, made by some judges was that the mother had, uh, had coached the kids to say what they said. Uh, and so some of the testimony was very consistent with what I experienced. And I had cases where the mother brought the kids into the legal aid office you know, the, the day or the day after we took them immediately. The child said anything, and I was very careful to send uh, the children uh, to somebody who could interview them, so it, it wouldn't be the mother asking the questions, but it would be uh, a psychiatrist or somebody who uh, would have uh, credibility with the court. And one of the difficulties I had is we didn't have interview centers, we didn't have anybody set up to do it, and in one case, interview the children. It was very difficult to operate at, at that time. There's been some improvements uh, in some areas, not everywhere in the states, with interview centers, and being set up uh, to uh, get the information from the children. 
but that I think that uh, bias on behalf of some judges continued to where they would assume that it was made up if it came out in, in the context of a marriage at all. And I, I have a question though, is this parental alienation syndrome, is it in the DSM, is it recognized? So I, to, in my opinion, it's not legitimate at all. And my experience is if a parent tries to alienate a child, it usually doesn't work. It usually alienates the child against the parent who's doing the alienating. Now that occurs sometimes, but not in these contexts. And also, uh, given what someone goes through when there's a child abuse allegation, uh, it, it defies common sense to think that someone would want to attempt to bring one out where there wasn't one. Uh, we had uh, all, in my office, every case was domestic violence. That, that was our standard, those were the only cases we took. There had to be domestic violence or child abuse. And it was a very small percentage where there was actually child abuse because um, these were the cases where the children had talked about something happening. They were very uh, difficult cases. And one of the problems was that the Child Protective Services was not interested in taking a case if it was already in the family law court. They thought that court can already handle it, so we don't have to do it. But then it was uh, one party versus another and in the context of, of family law. I also found it was tremendously uh, labor intensive. On the cases I handled, I had to put aside all my other cases to work on two or three cases that were heavily litigated by the other side. Uh, so I, I think part of the solution is absolutely a, a parent of a child where there's uh, abuse allegations must have a right to representation, period, in every single case. And there must be some quality of resources. It can't just be an appointed attorney who's gonna put a few hours in or just make an appearance in court. Uh, there has to be a, 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 enough funding uh, and enough resources to, to equalize the, the economic uh, battle that's occurring in the court. So both sides have equal resources. Now, and I don't think the family law court is necessarily the best place to do those cases. Uh, the, sometimes the, the juvenile court system or the child protective system can be, but it's not always either. Uh, it depends on the circumstances. But uh, at the very least, there has to be representation and there has to be the ability also to investigate the cases and get what other, uh, ever other resources are necessary for the case. Now, I followed some of the cases in Santa Barbara County in the juvenile court because the evidence just was, and at that time, the, the person from the district attorney was somebody that was put there because he wasn't very good in court. Uh, to me, that didn't make sense, but that's how they did it at that time, and so, <laughs> the cases were not properly presented in the court. So uh, as a legal aid attorney, all I had ever done at that time was civil cases. I would then be the person uh, to take that case uh, in, into the juvenile court. And it's really a, a sense of commitment on behalf of the attorney to do a very difficult case. Uh, so when it's not just having an attorney, but having the resources and making sure you have people that are trained and committed to, to what they're doing. Uh, somebody like Nina. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know that I have the answers, but I think that that, that brings us towards a solution. And uh, I think the education is important, not allowing the pseudoscience into the courtroom. If it's not a recognized syndrome or psychological condition, it's pseudoscience and doesn't belong in the courtroom at all. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we have to, uh, and I think the suggestion that we follow what's going on in the press and uh, involve the press makes perfect sense. Uh, the, the people, the victims that go into court shouldn't be alone, should never be alone. And that's my sense in listening to the people who spoke today, is that they were alone. And they should have representation, but the community should know about it. And I don't think there's anything ever wrong with letting the public know about it uh, where appropriate. And uh, if there's a particular judge or district attorney that isn't doing their job, it should be pointed out. No one should be and has a right to be in any public office if they're not doing their job. Yes? Uh, one of the problems is that when a victim is vocal, 
the family court will say, we're going to rule that you're not acting in your child's best interest by publicizing this, and therefore, we're going to take more custody or more visitation away from you. And to me, this is one of the most critical things in all of these cases. This is a free speech issue. There is virtually, in my opinion, no way that a family law case can ever meet a state's interest test to gag somebody and to, and to squelch their free speech because it's between two individuals. It's any kind of danger to the state. It's just retaliation by the judges to shut you up. And if they dangle your child in front of your face and saying, if you're public about this, we'll make sure you see even less of your child, most people are going to shut up and they're going to be terrified. Judicial terrorism. Uh, it is, uh, I, I think that in, you, there's always a, a judgment call to make as to, as to whether uh, uh, something, uh, if you want to talk about something public, you have a situation where things are happening that shouldn't be happening. Generally, uh, things seeing the light of day is more effective than uh, people not knowing about it. And just listening to the people who spoke today, I think if you didn't know, if you didn't have any experience with the system, um, then you would think, how could this be? How could this be true? And the tendency would be to try to say, well, they must be making it up, or it must not be true, because we we don't want to think that's true. Uh, now, I, I I I did in Santa Barbara County have the chance of appearing before some very good judges that were for a time when I was there that was was very in tune with this type of case, which was very helpful. But I found that uh, have, without the representation, I'm not sure it would have worked because. I did a lot to put the information together in a way that it would be uh, quickly understood. Sometimes a person who whose children are a victim it, it can be acting very emotionally. If you're acting emotionally, it could look like uh, just, it, it's easy for someone to paint the person as this person's crazy or this person uh, is seeing things that aren't there. And part of the role of the attorney is to make sure that everything gets presented in a, in a, in, in the appropriate way. Able to do, I I just did that in a case where the um, the uh, victim uh, grandmother was attempting to get custody of the kid because her daughter was murdered. The person who murdered her was was not the father of the children, but the, the father of the children had uh, brutally attacked the mother in several counties in California, uh, and there were felony convictions, ne never any prison time, in several places. And what I discovered is that no one had put this information together, and when she tried to present it, because uh, she was very upset, obviously, by the situation, it never came out quite that way. So I, I put it together for her in one notebook with a summary of what happened in each case and the disposition of each case. And she brought that to the court mediator. And I wasn't at that particular hearing, but she said, uh, the, the mediator said that, uh, that that she'd never seen anything put together like that. All it was is compiling all the cases from the various courts, but nobody does that for you. And sometimes when you're relying on the victim, uh, they're not in a place where they can get all the information or necessarily even know what's important. Write your questions down so you don't forget what they are. Yeah. Again, my name is Jean Jordan. I'm currently with the California District Attorneys Association as the Violence Against Women Act Director. And one of my primary roles is to uh, educate district attorneys, uh, law enforcement, and on occasion we have a role in judicial training. And I couldn't agree more that training is a critical uh, component uh, in getting your goals achieved. offices and in law enforcement is very uh, high. There's constantly new people. We need to emphasize training in these areas over and over again. I agree with Nina in a number of things she talked about in advocacy, and one of the things uh, that I think you all have to remember, your power is in your numbers. And the fact that you have groups like this um, and that you stick together in your local as a group, as a whole, um, has a significant amount of power. We're talking about uh, 
Are there faults in the justice system? Absolutely. As a prosecutor, I've been a defense attorney, women in civil court, um, dealing with battered women trying to uh, get their children. We see injustices across the board all the time. As in every profession, there are good and bad people. And while you have a significant role in trying to get bad judges removed, I would also suggest to you that you make good judges, good district attorneys, good law enforcement people your friends, uh, because they can have a significant role in giving you credibility and power in the things that you choose to do. One of the projects we're working on here in Yolo County is cropping up across the United States. They would encourage you to support and work with uh, professionals who are trying to uh, put these centers together is the Family Justice Centers. These centers are uh, a group of professionals who work in a multidisciplinary function, law enforcement, attorneys, attorneys who help with restraining orders, child custody issues. It's known as the one-stop shop for victims who are victims of domestic violence or sexual assault. And we're trying to get one going in Yolo County, and I appreciate Supervisor Provence's support of that project. Um, hopefully, we'll see one of these centers in, your, in this community soon. And any other communities that you live in or work in, if you hear about a family justice center, it is a way for us to provide wraparound services to address some of these problems that you're all talking about here today. And it's a very, very powerful movement. Uh, if you want to check it out on the internet, look up the Family Justice Alliance. The president of the Family Justice Alliance is Casey Gwynn, who was the uh, elected uh, city attorney of San Diego. Strack are uh, trying to cultivate uh, up this movement. They've got significant funding support. From grants pop up constantly now, which we can uh, use to support these projects. So there are some people working out there to deal with these issues, and I urge you to reach out to these individuals um, who are supportive and who have the power to assist you. Um, when Nina talked about um, getting bad judges out of court, that's a, that's a tough thing to do. As you all know, it's not easy, but taking part in the process, part in the voting process. It's unfortunate, I think, that so many judges are appointed because I think that has a lot to do with the lack of accountability. I also urge you to think through um, when you advocate for more, uh, or the uh, getting through the immunity for judges. The more, when you do things like that, there's also a backlash to it as well. And it could discourage good people from going to the bench. So I would, uh, I would encourage you to take a good hard look at uh, any legislation you uh, support in getting an, in lack of immunity for judges, because it could have significant impact on both sides. Um, I think taking part in the process, uh, the voting process, and in, at the legislature is a, a very good way to at least attempt to take care of bad judges, and I don't think any of us who work in the criminal justice system would say that there aren't a number of very bad judges on the bench. We see things happen that are atrocious every single day, and good prosecutors, good lawyers fight hard um, in court every day on your behalf and for people like you, so I encourage you to have some hope that there are people out here, professionals who do truly care about your issues and the safety of your children. Um, I'm coming at this from a little bit different point of view because the work that I've done has been all at the top of the judicial system uh, in this state. And I've observed things from that point of view for five years working for the Chief Justice and writing decisions and doing the things that a uh, staff attorney for the Chief Justice does. And then as, as an appellate lawyer handling some child custody cases, which I do, by the way, pro bono. I do not practice child custody law routinely, but I took these cases out of a conviction that the things that have been said in this room today, every single one of them, I have heard over and over again. These things are going on all over the system all the time. And this is this is a lousy system. Now, let me explain why I think it's a lousy system. First of all, the judicial attitude toward family law, 
family law departments and family law cases is rotten. And it's rotten from the top to the bottom. Judges do not want to do family law. It is the dregs of the judicial appointment system within the courts. The judges that move into the court by appointment or by election are usually given that or juvenile court first as their so-called apprenticeship, whether they have any inclination for that job at all. It is minimal and pathetic. The system, the appellate court judges, the justices that I work for on the state's highest court take little interest in family law generally. They believe that these lower court judges, who as I say have no interest or inclination to be where they are, ought to be making decisions that are nearly appeal proof. And by that I mean their discretion is so broad that unless these judges come out on the record in a case and declare racial bias or sexual bias or something that's the equivalent of that, they will not be reversed, regardless of how poor their decision making will be, regardless of how many factors they ignore on the record, regardless of how bad their fact finding may be, they will not be reversed. That is the broad general rule of California family law that any judge sitting in the lower court here figures out immediately. He or she is immune from careful appellate scrutiny. And that produces a whole set of attitudes, ladies and gentlemen, that you don't have in other cases. I take appeals professionally. I win a lot of appeals. I get these judges reversed all the time. I will not take family law appeals in child custody cases because it's not well impossible to get a reversal. And it's a shame that we have this attitude, but we have a job to do from the top in changing the attitude. A good part of this comes because the legislature of the state of California has largely abdicated a constitutional responsibility to place some procedural control on the court through statute making. The judicial council gets away with murder in the legislature. And I watched it happen when I was sitting there. There's a whole four people working for the administrative office of the courts and the judicial council. And I met these people, and I had some supervisory authority over some of the things they did. And I couldn't get them all to the welfare of the state. What would happen, though, is they were very effective lobbyists when they went over to the legislature, along with the California Judges Association. There is some sort of idea in the legislature, but in the reality, there are simply lobbyists with another set of interests. And some of these interests have to do with getting out of work. And some of them have to do with preserving power, blindly, in areas where they do not want to do the hard job of being trained and making decisions. The training, folks, is virtually nonexistent. And training and evaluation are key. We can't accomplish evaluation of judges. You know what's happened to evaluation of judges? In county bar associations. County bar associations used to take a survey of attorneys every year in many of our counties, and then publish the results of that. The results were very telling. They clearly tell the job, because the ones at the bottom cared for were clearly people that were not competent. And that certainly, in an important area like family law, they need to be pulled out of those departments and put someplace where they're listening to traffic cases or doing something that is harmless. But we practically abolished those cases, those evaluations, because of judicial pressure. The judges screamed in every county I know of that had a decent survey, you need to have evaluations to be part of the system. You have a right, a First Amendment right, to criticize a bad judge. These people are no more immune than a political official or political official. So criticism, I think, is very, very important. And part of that process is data. This is one thing I've been frustrated by. We need to have means of documenting what judges do in family courts so this evidence is available for legislative consideration. And one of the areas that's concerned me is disqualification of judges. I once tried to get the Judicial Council to give me information so that I could do a study on judicial disqualification in California, because largely, disqualification is swept under the rug. What happens is, a judge is appointed by the Judicial Council to hear a disqualification. 
And I say here advisedly, because usually the judge looks at some papers and immediately dismisses the challenge. Your only remedy is a writ to the Court of Appeal, which is denied in a one-line order. So that's essentially what you get in judicial disqualification. I wanted to look at those records, and they tell me that even though they appoint these independent judges, or so-called independent judges, and even though they get the initial paperwork, they don't keep it. They don't have the records that I could review. This kind of record keeping, and I can go on about other areas of family law, we ought to be keeping records so that the stories you folks tell, which are absolutely true, and they're true, and they're going on in hundreds in many counties across the state, that we can get this documented and show the magnitude of this problem in ways that are indisputable. That, that, that I think, is a critical piece of reform, that if I had to do something, I would make uh, our record keeping better than it is. Yes, ma'am. Supreme Court, I would vote for that position, but I would not get another single vote because they take the position, the court takes the position that you, you have all kinds of things that are reviewed by writ, and those writs become final. Statutes create all kinds of writ related remedies. This is a statutory remedy. This particular statute says you get a writ, you don't get an appeal. This, the court has appointed, has, has interpreted it that way, and so that's what you wind up with. And, you know, as I say, if it were me, I would change the statute to, to change that remedy. Because part of the problem is, you know, the standard, you guys know what the standard is for disqualification? That from the facts, a reasonable person would have a doubt that this judge would be impartial. That was designed to be a standard where you look at this, and if this judge has behaved in such a way as to suggest partiality to a reasonable person, be out of that case. Is that the way it works? No. 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 I mean, I've, I've, I've tried a few of these myself. I've tried three of them in my career. I lost two of them. I won one of them. Uh, the only one in which I managed to succeed, the judge was, was so vindictive that he required us to fly from San Francisco to Los Angeles simply so he could smile at us and continue a hearing because he knew disqualification proceedings were pending. We called in advance and we said, you know, could you please just postpone this until the disqualification is decided? And he got to show up, show up. And he made us show up to do that. We reported that to the independent judge and the independent judge not going on for doing that. I have one of those. The judge called me and that was Natalia, we're going to do the questions right after. Write them down so you don't forget because we do want to hear them. Yes, yes, I regret that case. I want to make a couple of other points before I pass it on because like some of the members of the panel haven't had a chance to talk yet. Um, I do think that it helps for associations of, of women's and children's groups to push bad judging in the press. And one of the things I wish some women's organizations would do is do a best and worst. You know how they do best and worst things at the end of the year where you say, here are the best judges in the state and family law, and here are the worst ones? Best apology. Get lots of awards. You know, get, get, because press will report things like that. And when you have the worst ones, you know, that, that you got some incidents, that'll get picked up. What you know, that'll, get? that'll get blocked. What do you think is dead? Yeah, yeah, you can. I mean, you have, you have a right to. To criticize, get a, get a court order that forbids you from talking about cakes. Yes. Yeah. 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 
which I worked in. That, that order was unconstitutional. That's about all I can say about it. I mean, um, yeah, and I just want to uh, make a couple other points. There's, there's something that's always puzzled me, and remember, I come from family law on the outside. Uh, the standards are extremely low for professionals here. People have mentioned on this panel getting better systems of training and evaluation. I look at the rules of court, and I looked at them again before I came over here today, and I am just appalled at the lack of training for people that are doing evaluations and are representing children in the most important cases that these kids are ever going to be involved in in, in their whole lives. Um, I represented Judith Wallerstein. Uh, uh, some of you know Dr. Wallerstein. She is probably the leading expert in this country in the effect of divorce on children. She's in about the 40th year of a longitudinal study where she's followed the same families for 40 years. And she's published several books. She's a bestseller. She's been on Oprah. And she couldn't help on tape. And she's, 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 she's a terrific person. Just absolutely terrific person and, and, and top expert. She tells me that she believes that for somebody to be properly trained to do evaluations of custody, they need a full year of graduate training and experience beyond the degrees that are listed here. You know, so in addition to having a degree, they need that training. Why? Because most psychologists, social workers, uh, and even the marriage family people in their regular training don't get the kind of intensive training in children, particularly small children, as to how to communicate with them and how to evaluate what they're thinking and feeling. And that takes some intensive training. This stuff ought to be done in our schools. We ought to be using graduate level training. We have very well qualified people that can have this training. But we, we keep these standards extremely low so the good old boys out there can get appointments from the local judges and so the system can work. You know, this very profitable system, extremely profitable system for some people, uh, who quite often are being appointed because the appointer, namely the judge, knows how they're going to come out. And there, there's an expectation of what the evaluation is going to look like. The other thing is it, evaluating custody reports. We don't do any centralized evaluation of custody reports in the state. People that are making these important decisions ought to be reviewed, and, and they ought to be evaluated by some senior level folks that really know what's going on with custody and aren't connected with local politics, aren't, you know, don't have a financial interest in the system. That, that's, a, that's a very critical thing, and we really don't do any of it. The thing that's always puzzled me, though, is this link, and some of you have mentioned it here. Uh, it was just mentioned a, a, a second ago here. How we link some of the things that happen in the course of custody disputes and the best interest of the child in having a good parent raising that child. You know, if, if sexual abuse is charged, particularly in situations where we have police or we have evaluating psychologists saying there's evidence of abuse here, first of all, that ought to be conclusive that no retaliation be taken of any kind against somebody who brought that to the attention of the court. Nothing ought to be able to happen to that person. Nothing in the custody decision and nothing in any other way. And yet, how many times do the courts punish, particularly women, because of things that happen that really aren't affecting their ability as parents at all? They don't ever make the link and they don't ever require evidence that whatever got said, whatever got complained about, whatever got said to the press, for example, has any impact on this child. When a, when, a, when a young child particularly has a good parent that cares about them and is raising them, the fact that something happened and, and, and got in the newspaper uh, probably makes very little difference in, in the life of that child. And yet I, I see constantly we're going to punish the woman for doing what the woman does without requiring any evidence at all that the child got harmed by it. Oh, oh, no, by no means. By no means. These things that go on in the system, and I, I'd like to conclude that, that this was accidental. I'd like to conclude it was merely incompetence and that education would do more about it. There's an ingrained bias here. Uh, I, I argued two cases in the California Supreme Court about eight years apart. The, the Burgess case in 1996, these were move away cases, for those of you who know that issue. Uh, move away is a very important issue, uh, particularly for women that are taking care of their children and, and that need to move because of the divorce situation. Lots of reasons for that, very good ones. Jobs, education, uh, childcare for family, lots of reasons that that happens. 
1996, we had a landmark decision written by Justice Moss that allowed women to come into court with a presumption that if they were taking care of that child, if they were the primary caretaker, that they should be able to determine the residence of the child. And reasons had to be then generated against that and evidence against that to overcome that presumption. In 2004, the Supreme Court took that back in the Lamouche case and effectively gave us a rule that whatever the lower court judge wants to do, move or not move, is fine with us. We don't care what standards they apply, we don't care what they do. It, it really doesn't make any difference. And, and this has made a tremendous amount of difference in decision making. It gives these lower court judges a sense that doesn't make a difference. I can do whatever I want. I can deny this woman petition to move. I can say there's no abuse here, even though the report is sitting there by the only competent evaluator that says there is abuse. They can do whatever they want. We have got to limit this discretion, folks. There's got to be a you abuse, you lose law in this state. <laughs> Superior Court folks, good Lord, you know, I went and sat in the family law department in that court once in the back of the room, and I watched the calendar, and I got to tell you what I saw, because it just, it just amazed me that nobody even sees the connection here. The judge had a couple in, in front of him, and they were both representing themselves, which, which happens quite frequently in family law courts. Some of our calendars, two-thirds or three-fourths of the people are self-represented now. Um, and this was a case of spousal abuse. And the judge turns to mom and, and wife, ex-wife, and says, um, well, we've got the restraining order in place now, so, so things should be okay. You, know, you report it to the police, and he continues to beat you up and do things to you. You, know, you, you, you report that, and, and we should be okay with that. And then she turns around to dad, who's standing on the other side, and said, you know, gee, Mr. Hernandez, we really got to get you more time with your children, don't we? You know, you, re you really need to have greater contact with them. And I'm going to hear, oh, Jesus, does anybody connect this? You know, and I'm looking around me, and all the family law bar are just sitting there, oh, okay, here we go, you know, this is the way it works. You know, it, it's, 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 it, to me, it's, it's under that category of judicial events, which I call shocking but not surprising. It's horrible that it happens, but it happens typically. So I, 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 can, I can keep going, and I don't want to do that. I, I want to get the other members of the panel. We love your rant. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, could you, could you say your name, please, for us all? Uh, my name is Tony Tanky, T-A-N-K-E. Thanks for being frank about the appellate process. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Didn't matter that it cost twenty five thousand dollars to go through the appeal. At least, um, at least. At, 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 at least. That's, that's the bargain price. Yeah, that's the bargain price. Yeah. Yeah. We're already destitute, and that's you know hopeful that there might be something coming out of that, and then you'll have nothing. Happen. It won't. It won't. So go right ahead. Uh, my name is Tiffany Seuss, and I prosecute child sexual abuse cases in this county. And what I was thinking about when I was hearing a lot of your stories. Um, was that um, in terms of the criminal perspective as to what can happen, um, if you feel that um, law enforcement isn't listening to what your reports are, um, whether that be a patrol officer that came out or a detective, um, you obviously can always go higher than them, but you can always call the district attorney's office, and I have that happen um, here in Willow County. And we're made aware of something, we can always follow up with that police agency. And so if there is actually um, a criminal case, or I think sometimes um, what law enforcement will say, well, the case has been sent to the district attorney's office, call the district attorney's office. And most offices have um, specific prosecutors that are assigned to handle these cases, and I handle the cases um, here in Yolo County. So if you are, I think Nina was talking about being the squeaky wheel, making sure that you're calling that's going to, um, you know, everyone is busy in this profession and they've got a lot of cases, but if you're calling, they're going to get back to you. And I can tell you when I have parents that are calling me, I do make sure that I get back to them and I'm not going to ignore those phone calls. So to make sure you are back, or, you know, grandmothers, you know, things like that. When, if, if someone's just label, labeling it as a child custody 
rescued. If you have someone else in the family that can call as well to get someone's attention um, to listen, I think that that is something that you should do um, to try to get uh, the district attorney's office involved. And that certainly when we are involved in the process, and I spoke a little bit about this this morning, the very first thing that I do um, at arraignments is make sure that bail is set at the schedule it should be so the person can't get out and can't be around that child. And also that there's a criminal protective order that's issued, meaning that the person can't have any contact with that child and sometimes even other children. And I know that if there is a family law case that's going on where everyone's deciding to get that restraining order, once we get into criminal court, that's something that's typically issued by an arraignment that can um, protect your child. So that is something on, at least on the criminal side, that um, you know is something that I do. And I think that Nina had also spoke about Marcy's Law, which has been um, excellent in the area of child sexual abuse, because what, what happens in a lot of these cases is you will get defense attorneys that will serve the mother, let's say, you know, if in a scenario that it is the father that's accused of the sexual abuse, will serve the mother with subpoenas to try to get the school's, psych uh, or get the child's um, psychological records, um, school records, things like that, where before the parent wouldn't really know what to do and the district attorney really couldn't do much about that because standing in the criminal courts. Well, now when those type of tactics are used by defense attorneys to try to get um, confidential records of a child victim, the district attorney now handling the case has standing um, so long as they have permission from the victim or the um, victim's parent to go to the criminal court and object to the release of those documents. Um, so I think that um, you know, before that, you had the scenario where parents were there getting served with a subpoena that says, I have to show up to court and I have to get these records. And a lot of times people would just give them over because they think that they had to. So at least now with the passage of Marcy's Law with the district attorney, we can be involved in that process um, in objecting to any type of subpoena along those lines. The other thing um, that I wanted to talk about, I know some people have talked about a, having a a jury system within um, family law. And coming from the perspective as a prosecutor that has that presents child sexual abuse cases to a jury, I'm not so sure that a jury is exactly what you want in the family law context. Um, the reason I say that is um, in child sexual abuse cases, and we talked a little bit about that this morning, they are not easy to prove. And juries go in, you know, certain jurors go in with a bias. Um, if there's someone that's had a bad family law situation. And so even I have cases where um, you don't have child custody. I mean, I think some people talked about that. One person said something, someone was from an intact home, but the moment that is uttered within the area of child sexual abuse and a criminal prosecution, you have jurors that are ready to not convict and think this child was coached. And the thing that I find frustrating in the cases that I handle is um, you know, if your child reports they've been sexually abused, obviously as a parent you want to talk to them about that. But it's very different from grilling them about what had happened to them. And so when jurors find out that you talk to your child about being sexually abused and they want to automatically think that a parent has been coaching that child, which is so frustrating for me and it's something that I constantly argue to juries that, well, of course you're going to talk to your child, but that doesn't mean that you ask them questions about what had happened to them or that this child has been coached. So that was just something that um, when that idea was mentioned um, to have a jury um, in the family law context uh, as opposed to a judge, I'm not so sure that um, that would be the best case scenario just given what I've seen in the criminal arena um, as to how critically children are judged and how um, the, their parents are judged for any conversations that they've had about the case. Um, I think that um, along the lines of what Jean was saying, there are some good judges out there, and, and um, you know, if you are fortunate enough to get one of those judges within the family law context, that's great, but obviously plenty of you haven't had that. But I think that um, education is really important, and I've noticed as a prosecutor, um, there are judges that have never done, um, you know, even in Yolo County, that have never done a criminal prosecution of child sexual abuse case. And so the burden really is on the prosecutor. And what I do is I file briefs just to educate them on certain issues that are relevant in these types of cases. 
And that so once you, and what I have seen in my experience is that once you go through some of these cases with some of these judges, and they do become a little more educated, you start having them get what you're saying, get the rulings, and get some things in your favor. But I also had the opposite, um, that they don't get what you're saying, and you're the only one in there that's um, you know, fighting for that child. So I, I agree that when, when everyone said it's not a perfect system by any means, there are flaws in the system, <laughs> But, um, and I've had cases that I've been very disappointed in seeing how they were handled, but I also have had cases where there are successes. So um, I think that the educational component with the judges is really important and something that you know I try to do as a prosecutor, even when I have got a case in front of them, to do it in a way that's um, not so offensive that this is what I'm telling you to do, but I'm just providing you some of the, the education and sometimes I think what we were talking about, what your demeanor can be and the way you present it to the judge, there is some effectiveness um, in the way that you can present your information. One thing, Tiffany, just to on, just so you know, in criminal restraining orders, it's a case in the other restraining order in the state of California, and actually I think every state follows that. So even if the family law judge has issued a restraining order that has allowed supervised contact or unsupervised, if the criminal, if there is a criminal case going, get your deputy district attorney or to order a restraining order with no contact. It will automatically supersede, and the family law judge cannot supersede. There's no reason it isn't. And right now, Connie, you guys are having trouble, uh, according to the article, in, <laughs> yeah. in, in getting them to fork over the documents. Yeah. Maybe there's no law. Tony, if, if we can get you an appointment, will you go talk to the auditors about what you know? <laughs> awesome. We got there. We got there. All right. <laughs> Thank you. 
Lydia Levy because I was still in my internship that year, but I was part of the first conference when we had this and a women's choir here singing for our closing. And I've been here pretty much every conference since then, doing what I can, you know, but not every year I've had small children at some point. But now I'm doing more again. And um, I think uh, I, I I think about two or three years ago when I was uh, when I was legislative director, I think it was three years ago, when I was writing a letter and I wanted to figure out okay, how many people are there in this organization? Because we had someone say, oh, just make up an organization and just you can just be one person and pretend, but we're not pretending. I found it and there were more than 50 who had been active, you know, who had spoken, who had been active in the conference. And that was a few years ago. There's more than that now. Now, not everyone is active all the time. Because, you know, you burn out. This is very painful and difficult, especially when we're around your protective parents. I mean, it's like, okay, it happened to me a long time ago, but it's still happening to you and your children. It's very hard, you know, but that doesn't mean we can give up, you know. We, we need to keep speaking out because our society wants to, this is ugly, they don't like it, they will deny, they will say, because I'm too functional, then that means it could have been that bad. Or if I'm not functional, they'll say, well, she's crazy, so don't believe anything she says. So they're never going to want to believe adult survivors. Um, and that's just the way it is. But that means we can't shut up because that's what they want. And that that's that would be surrendering. And I'm not going to roll over and die. I'm just going to keep fighting for those kids that are still being hurt. So thanks.